Hey everyone, hope you guys are having a good evening or morning or whenever you're listening to this afternoon. Um, today we are going to be talking about another, having a moment here with this with my, with my head. We're going to take, I'm having a little bit of a moment with feedback here, so give me a second guys. Hold on. I usually don't have these technical difficulties that I'm having right now. That being said, anyways, um, we're going to be talking today to Casey Robinson. Her sister was Jennifer Wicks and her niece was Adriana Wicks and they went missing 20 years ago. Um, but there was recently a development in the last few weeks or last week or so where they served a warrant, which we're going to talk about on the person who I would say is probably the prime suspect on this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead without further ado and bring on Casey and let her introduce herself. Hey, Casey, how are you doing? Hey, Justin, I'm good. How are you? I am doing well. Well, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, thank you for doing this for us, for my sister and for my niece. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So um, what I want to kind of talk about, I guess we'll get right into it. it. It's been a pretty big and exciting week for you, I would say, as far as everything goes. Um, why don't you real quick introduce yourself and uh, we'll kind of then get into it from there. Sure. Um, I am Casey Robinson. My maiden name is Wix. Jennifer is my big sister. I am her baby sister. Um, and Adriana is my niece. So uh, Jennifer was 21 when she went missing. Adriana was two. All right. So, and I watched, and first off, before we go any further, I'm going to tell you to go follow her on TikTok. Um, she's just growing her TikTok account. I think today is your first day on it. It is. Um, yeah. We have, we had to twist your arm a little bit uh, to get on TikTok, but I think you're up to like almost 700 followers. This story definitely needs attention. It is. She did like a nine part thing on it and I watched every bit of it and it's insane. I mean, the story truly is it's, it's insane. And the fact that it went cold, well, you'll, you'll get to kind of understand why in a minute, but it just doesn't seem like there's no reason this story should have gone cold. Like no. the prime suspect in it. The stories change. He, there are things that don't even exist in his stories, like the four. Well, I don't want to put it ahead, but like four door certain cars that never have been four door certain cars, and just absolutely nothing has been done about it. So, I guess if you want to, I don't want to take the thunder from it. Do you want to just kind of share share your story as to you know, I guess what happened, and yeah. you know what brought us to this moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in 2004, Jennifer and Adriana just vanished into thin air, just disappeared, which people just, they don't do. There's always someone responsible if someone just completely disappears. But I had just turned 16 and, uh, you know, was still a kid then. And I wasn't, I mean, I was involved, but my mom just kind of took the brunt of, fighting for justice for them for the past 20 years. And, and I picked it up in the last couple of years and just kind of poured over everything that my mom had collected uh, over the years, all of the interviews, all of the um, surveilling that she did, overnight trips out of state to chase leads and whatnot. Um, so I've been just kind of pouring over that for the last couple of years, questioning people, talking to people that we've never really talked to before, getting getting those leads that, that we need. But um, kind of the backstory, if you want me to jump into that, Justin, is uh, Jennifer and her boyfriend met in 2003. And my mom and myself and my stepdad lived in Las Vegas at the time. My mom took a job in Vegas. And I kind of start here before their disappearance because it kind of gives you that backstory of their relationship and how it started and and then you get to how it ended. Um, but July of 2003, they met. Uh, we were in Vegas. Jennifer came out to visit us, which I've shared some of the, if you get on uh, our Facebook, Instagram, and I'll share some on TikTok eventually when I get the hang of it. But um, they came out to visit us. And that was, um, you know, 
that was good to have them out there away from the situation that that she was in. Uh, while we were in Vegas, probably around August of 2003, um, my mom got a phone call. Jennifer and Joey had gotten into an argument. She was frantic. Uh, he had a lot of people get this story mixed up and you'll read different things, but they had gotten into an argument or something like that and he had pulled out a gun. Um, I don't know if that was pulled a gun on her. I don't know how that gun was used, but um, from what I remember and from my mom's notes and her memory and recollection, it was just pulled on Jennifer and Adriana and himself. Um, so threatening to take all of their lives. So that's kind of how it started just a month into their relationship, a month or so into their relationship. That's how it started. So my mom within a couple of weeks, picked up everything, moved back to Tennessee. Uh, so that was how their relationship started. After that, Jennifer and Joey broke up. His name's Joey Benton. Um, so William Joseph Benton is his, his full name. So if you hear him referred to as one of those names. Um, so whenever we moved back, Jennifer and Adriana moved in with us. We lived in Cross Plains, Tennessee. We lived, Cross Plains, Tennessee is a very small town. It's like, one of the towns that have one blinking red light in them. They have like one teensy tiny little grocery store and like a barbecue place. Um, <laughs> so it's just a very old town. Everyone knows everyone. There's no secrets, uh, that sort of town. And so we live right on the main road. Jennifer and Adriana lived like in a downstairs apartment. In December, I guess Jennifer had started like talking to him again uh, against my mom's wishes, by the way, uh, but sort of talking to him behind the scenes and they started to work things out. They decided to get back together. My mom uh, comes home from work one day and they're packing up my sister and niece's things in our basement. And my mom's like, y'all are not going back to that. Um, Jennifer had mentioned things about his family, like weapons, uh, drugs, just all within an arm's length, anywhere in that house, the things that they were involved in. Uh, Jennifer had mentioned that to my mom before. So my mom was like, absolutely not. Y'all are not going. Uh, that turned into probably one of the most traumatic days of my life. Uh, that was at the end, a couple of days before Christmas in 2003. Um, so my mom's saying, you know, you can't go back there. And, and he's like, oh, she's coming. And my mom's like, no, you can't take my daughter. And he just looks at her and says, you don't have a daughter anymore. B word. Uh, I don't know if I can say that. Um, I mean, just within inches of her face, just looks at her, says you don't have a daughter anymore. You, you can say that, by the way. It's okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, because the gravity of that and like where their relationship goes is just huge. And so the gun part, uh, you know, in the beginning of their relationship, this part, um, whenever he gets in my mom's face and says that at the time I'm 15, I'm seeing all this happen. The baby, Adriana, um, I mean, that, that picture right there is probably very close to that time. Um, but things escalated from there. He's putting Jennifer's things in the, in the truck outside. Uh, we shut the door behind him whenever he went out. Uh, and then he came back, he kicked down our front door. Um, and, and he and Jennifer left. I, I took Adriana into the back room and called 911. The police showed up, took our reports and went out. That was a very traumatic time. We were still dealing with that, um, court hearing and all of that, you know, it gets pushed back and pushed back, but we were still dealing with that like right before their disappearance. And so his family and my family didn't really get along after all of that for obvious reasons. We weren't, you know, allowed to go over there. And after that, Jennifer didn't really talk to us for a period of time. So probably from like right before Christmas, we missed Adriana's birthday, which is January 14th. Um, she had a Blues Clues birthday party at the Benton home um, that we weren't part of. Um, and so she started coming around again, probably around mine and my mom's birthday in February. We share a birthday on February 22nd. So when I say she 
started coming around, she started to call us again. And Jennifer was in contact with everyone in my family on her dad's side of her family, which her dad and my mom uh, are not married at this point um, for a while. He lived in Manchester, south of Nashville. And so she would talk to them all the time. Uh, she would talk to my family members all the time. And so she started to come around again and talk to us after that happened in December around a little bit before my birthday. And then Joey dropped her off at my birthday party, my sweet 16, and just kind of like dropped her off on the curb uh, right outside of our house on that main road because he wasn't really allowed to come in after that. Um, so... Anyway, she came in to say, hey, and we started to like mend that relationship at that period of time. And I mean, shortly after that, next month uh, is whenever things started to happen. Um, and then this is whenever I kind of jump into what happened the week of their disappearance. And there's kind of a lot to unpack there. So I don't know if you want me just to jump right in uh, because I can. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a lot. Um, like I said, you, so I'm not trying to make you smaller, there, but, uh, yeah. it's definitely a lot because I mean, I looked at, it and I was just, well, I was talking to my wife all about it when we were going to pick up our daughter today. I was like, you, do you, how much do you know about this story? Because like I sat here and I was listening to it so I could make the video. Like this is the notes that I took just off of those nine videos. So, I mean, it was a yeah. lot, but yeah, and I definitely have questions about it. So I'm just going to let you start telling it when I have a question, I'll kind of stop you, I guess, but. Okay. So obviously their relationship, not in a good place, rocky. So whenever you hear us say they had a rocky relationship, it's because we have these times, which by the way, there was no police report filed for the first time when she called us when we lived in Vegas. Um, I wish there had been. That way we have a history. Uh, we do have a police report for the incident in December. Um, although at that point in time, even though it was traumatic for all of us, that wasn't really towards Jennifer in a way, you know. So even though we have that, that wasn't towards her. Um, but they would break up and get back together, break up, get back together, their entire relationship. Um, so whenever she stopped talking to us in December, they lived like in this barn shed thing. Um, I actually shared it on Facebook for the first time and Instagram for the first time the other day, just so people could see what I was talking about. Because when I say they lived in this barn shed, it was on his parents' property, kind of like in a wooded area. And they would have to walk back and forth from this barn shed thing um, to his parents' house to like have dinner and whatnot. Um, and this barn shed thing is like something that you would see outside in a parking lot, like at Lowe's. Um, so like a big, I don't know, probably like a 12 by 16 shed. Okay. Um, they had redone the inside of it. I have pictures of the inside of it, um, of them and some friends of theirs. Um, and so there was drywall on the wall, but it wasn't like finished drywall. It was very makeshift. Uh, there was carpet, but it wasn't like installed, you know, um, and they had like a little window air thing. And then there was just nastiness everywhere. Just the baby just should not have been living in there. Anyways, they were living in this barn shed thing in the winter. It started getting cold like it does in Tennessee. It gets really cold. Um, so they moved in with his parents. Uh, they lived on Owens Chapel Road in Springfield, Tennessee. And his parents' house at the time, they were building a house. They had just started, and we can talk about that. Um, but there was no structure or anything yet. But they were building on a five-acre plot right next to, yeah, there it is. They were building on a five-acre plot right next to their property. So they lived in this little single-family home that was like three bedrooms, two bathrooms, kitchen, living room kind of deal. Very small little, little house um, sitting on an acre right beside a cemetery. Um, so of course, mom and dad, uh, Joe and Cindy are their names, Benton, and then Jennifer and Joey had their room. And then they had kind of like a spare third bedroom that they put Adriana in. Um, and then at the time of their disappearance, and I'll jump into the week that they disappeared, but Joey had built Adriana, um, like a little toddler bed. He had actually built her a cute little rocking horse too for Christmas. And 
I'm bringing those things up for a reason just to help you understand like him as a person and how I try to like figure out who this person is that my sister loved. Um, so they lived there with his parents in this three bedroom home and everything. I don't know if you've ever lived with anyone, Justin, or if anyone watching has ever lived with anyone. I personally have lived with other people, roommates and boyfriend's yeah. parents in the past, like things that's hard. It can get hard for like long periods of time. Right. So right. I think that's what started to happen. Um, I don't really know if my sister was telling anyone like that things were getting that way. But once they moved into his parents' house, that's whenever things started to like drastically go downhill. And Joey's mom just did not like her. Um, I've talked to some of his friends and people that were around him back then. And, um, they told me that she was jealous of Jennifer and their relationship, that she had a really close relationship with her son, like an awkwardly close relationship, not like, like a cute one, but like awkward. Um, so that was like what Jennifer was dealing with. Um, so I'll start on Monday. 22nd March real 22nd. quick okay real, real quick if I may so um based on what your sounds like it sound um so I grew up in a very toxic environment and uh okay. my mom was kind of like what you're talking about I don't obviously I don't know Joey's parents I don't know anything about them my mom is um if she would go get diagnosed she'd probably be diagnosed as a narcissist and one thing that they do is they will take and have what's called uh, it's emotional incest Basically, it's, it's where they basically take all they're not getting their needs met from their partners emotionally or mentally. So they take that all, all out on their son. And those relationships then mm -hmm. become really kind of weird. So just giving you that information just so you have it. But yeah, it so, seems like it might be like that. And when you look at a case like Gabby Petita, the same kind of thing happened with Brian Laundrie. Right. Um, it's it, it's just like it's like one of those those situations. Yeah, no, that sounds exactly what it could be. Um I mean, that that's just from what people told me. Again, I was 15, 16 at the time. So yeah. I'm just like, like regurgitating all the things that I've heard from people. Um, and so, and friends of his. And so I feel like it's probably somewhat accurate. And I mean, they witnessed it. So March 22nd, it was a Monday. Um, Adriana wasn't feeling well. And she calls, Jennifer calls my mom. And she's like, Adriana's not feeling good. Uh, no one here will take me to the doctor. I've asked them. And Cindy, Joey's mom, was a nurse. I don't know her exact position, but she worked at like a hospital in Gallatin um, in Sumner County, Sumner Regional or something like that. Um, but she worked at a hospital there uh, about 45 hour away, you know, depending on traffic. But she, I guess, told Jennifer, like, she's fine. She doesn't need to go. But she was screaming and crying whenever she tried to go pee. I mean, she's still in diapers, right? So her diapers weren't filling up, whatever. So she's telling mom, like, I think, you know, mom intuition, like, something's wrong. I need to get her into the doctor. So my mom is, says, do you want me to come get you? And Jennifer's like, no, uh, they don't want you here. <laughs> After everything that had happened in December and we were in court and whatnot. So there's just a lot of drama there. So my mom's like, okay, well, call your granny, her granny Wicks on her dad's side, that's her grandmother or your aunt, which is my mom's sister. And my aunt lived, I don't know, less than five minutes just down the road from them, or like right around the corner. Um, so she ends up calling my aunt and my aunt comes to pick her up pick her and Adriana up and takes them to Northcrest Hospital in Springfield. And so they're there at like 11 o'clock at night, kind of staying into the wee hours of the morning. And while they're there, they run some tests and whatnot, um, urine tests. And Adriana has an infection and she has an infection, like I put in my videos earlier today, um, that's commonly seen in sexually active adult women. And Jennifer and my aunt were both there and they 
recall this nurse telling them that. And we have the paperwork for it. We have the medical records and everything, which we didn't get until a couple years ago. But of course, police have them. We just couldn't get our hands on them because we're not Adriana's, um, uh, what do you say? We're not her guardians or yeah. Guardian next of kin. Um, so we can get the, access. If Sorry. you don't want me asking, cause I've been trying to rack my brain since I saw that video. What was the infection? I'm like, what could this be? Or do you not know? I do know she had that. You... Okay. Um, so if you do research on that completely fine, there's, there are ways that you can get that, but is it common in a two year old? No, no. It's just not. So, okay. I say that because my sister and my niece are gone. Right. And so we're, what happened to them? And so I am looking for all of the reasons how that could have happened, how they could have, you know, vanished. That's one of, one of the reasons that I've come up with. Okay. That's a pretty strong reason. It's a strong reason um, not to accuse anyone. I am not doing that. We have no proof of that. And of course, no, we're not getting sued today. Yeah, we're not getting sued today. <laughs> my niece is not here, so I can't ask her. We can't test her. Um, so unfortunately, I'm going off of what my sister and my aunt told my mom on the way home from the hospital that night. Um, they were told from the nurse, this isn't common. Um, it's common in people that are sexually active, not a two-year-old. So Jennifer and Adriana go back to the Benton residence uh, that night. The following day on Tuesday, the 23rd, they go to Adriana's pediatrician uh, just for a follow-up appointment. And the pediatrician tells her, yes, but it can also be from wearing a diaper too long. Okay. So again, we're not going to accuse anyone. Um, there are other ways that you can get that infection. Okay. So Tuesday evening, uh, whenever my mom gets off work, Jennifer talked to her during the day while she was at work. And my mom says, I'm going to make you some, uh, we're country. We live in the country. Uh, <laughs> We make everything from scratch for years and years and years. It's handed down from generations before us. So my mom made some like homemade butt butter. They actually have a diaper cream called that, but it was homemade. So my mom, um, you know, told Jennifer, meet me in town uh, because Joey drove my sister everywhere. My sister did not have a phone, did not have a car. Uh, so she kind of relied on Joey or other family members to take her places. Um, so she said, have Joey bring you into town and I'll meet up with you and, and give you this. So they met at Dollar General in Cross Plains on that same main road. Again, we're talking like a one red light, one street town. And there was a Dollar General there right behind the grocery store that comes up later. That's where they met. Um, a mom, mom recalls Adriana being like, just super out of it, just looked awful, uh, pitiful. She was crying to go home with my mom. Um, you know, saying she called my mom Mimi. So she was like, Mimi, I want to go with you. I want to go with you. And, you know, my mom is like, I got to work tomorrow, baby. You know, you got to, you got to go with mom. Maybe she'll bring you by this weekend. Um, you know, one of the biggest regrets of my mom's life right there. Just that Tuesday is marked in her memory. Um, so my mom also remembers on the way there, Jennifer talking to her on Joey's phone and saying like, okay, yeah, we'll meet you at the Dollar General. And Joey just in the background of the phone being like, get off my phone. You're using my minutes because cell phone plans back then were not like they are now, but you know, they yeah. were minute plans, you know? So he's Except like, three nights and weekends. You had three nights yeah. and weekends starting at nine. And yeah. And then sprint came out and you had seven. Yeah. So just to get the younger people in here are people who forgot how, terrible it was back then for cell phones. Yes. Just a reminder. Yeah. Y now y'all get unlimited minutes. That wasn't a thing then. Um, so I understand him wanting her to get off his phone, but then I don't because the baby's yeah. upset. She's sick and Jennifer's just needs to talk to her mom so he can just get lost. Right. So I just wanted to note that like, that's like the kind of like control and like the things that he would be like 
doing to just have that control. Okay, so that was Tuesday. That's the most notable thing on Tuesday, other than which we can definitely get into if we get that deep, but just where his parents were, where he was, who was working and who was home, that sort of thing. Those are all relevant um, whenever you're trying to figure out what happened here. Wednesday is a pretty significant day. Um, you know, whenever you look into our case, March 24th, 2004, some people say, you know, they're missing since that date. Um, I stand firm on March 25th, 2004. And I'll tell you why. So on March 24th, 2004, my sister and Adriana were at home um, with Joey's family in the evening. And my mom had gotten home from work and was settling in for bed that night. And she recalls it being late. We don't have our phone records. And I've tried reaching out to AT&T and they just, they don't hold their records that long, unfortunately. Law enforcement has those phone records and can confirm all of this. Of course, they can't share anything with me uh, because it's open and active. All right. Um, there are no cold cases in Tennessee, by the way. Um, there's no cold case unit at the TBI or Robertson County Sheriff's Department or Sumner County or any other county. There's no cold cases. Just want to throw that out there. Um, that's something that needs to change, by the way. So my mom's settling in for bed and her phone rings and um, Jennifer is upset and she hears Adriana crying in the background and mom's like, where's Adriana? And she's like, she's in the other room. You know, Joey's trying to help her go to sleep. We're trying to sleep train her in her toddler bed. Um, I don't know how many people listening or Justin, I think you've got a little one. Um, sleep training is no fun. And some people start early. Uh, I've had people comment on posts that I've made being like, oh, that's early. Or why is he in there trying to sleep train? But as a mom, it's really hard, and my kids slept with me because I just sucked at sleep training. And so <laughs> they Mine, were kind of... Mine's four, and she still sleeps with us most of the time. So it's, yeah. I get it. I've got an eight-year-old, almost eight-year-old, and she comes in our bed every now and then, and that's just how it is, okay? So maybe they were sleep training a little too early, but whatever. So my sister was like, I always bring her in bed with us. So Joey is like the stronger one who can like withstand her crying and whatnot. So he was passed out in the other room. The baby was just crying. Um, so she was basically crying it out. No one in there to console her in the dark. And then my mom remembers hearing like yelling through the door. Jennifer was locked in Joey and Jennifer's room on the phone. And she could hear yelling and screaming through the door. So they had been fighting all evening long, she said. Um, she said that Joey's mom was calling her a worthless mother, saying that um, Joey didn't need to be pretending to be the baby's mom. Uh, because Joey is not Adriana's father, by the way. That question comes up a lot. Um, we can talk about bio dad, too, uh, in a little bit. But uh, he's not Adriana's father. And I guess his mom was upset. He was pretending to be, said he shouldn't be in there trying to put the baby to sleep. Um, and so Jennifer also told my mom that night, Cindy had thrown their food out the back door. The um, kitchen just led right outside to a side door, just thrown their food outside. So they didn't even eat dinner. Um, threw it outside, was like, you can eat your food off the ground like dogs do. Just going absolutely insane. And she said that Joey's dad, Joe, also was like typically just not involved in any of their like little spats or any of the family drama. But even that night she said, she said, mom, he's typically nice to me and he doesn't really get involved, but tonight he got in my face. So there's a lot of turmoil going on. Jennifer's in the room. Mom's like, just go get Adriana. This isn't a good night to sleep train. And so she's like, okay. She's like, keep me on the phone, go get her. So she goes to get her, brings her in the room, shuts the door. Adriana just kind of like whimpers a little bit, mom says, and then she just falls asleep. And Jennifer, I'm just telling you the only words that my mom remembers, um, you know, these last conversations here. And she just says, oh, mom, she just wanted me. She just laid her head down and went right to sleep. And so... Adriana's asleep on her chest and mom's like, Jennifer, like, do you want me to come and get y'all? And Jennifer's like, no, mom, like, I'm an adult. 
we'll talk about everything tomorrow and I'll call you tomorrow. They hang up. Jennifer never calls my mom. My mom never speaks to her again. So the next day is Thursday, March 25th, 2004. Um, Jennifer and Adrienne are at home that day. And I don't know who's home with her. I may have some new information about that. Um, but for the last 20 years, we did not know who was home with her that day. But we have kind of an idea. Joey was at work in Franklin, Kentucky, which is just, um, it's north of there. I don't know exactly how far it is. I always thought that it was like 45 minutes or so. But someone I was talking to the other day was like, it's like 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, Franklin's not far at all. Yeah, they were like, it's not, it's not that far. Um, so he wasn't that far. Joey works construction. They do like steel framing and whatnot. So commercial. Um, and he worked for one of his dad's friends and like really close friends. A lot of Joey, uh, Joey's friends and even my cousin worked for this guy. Uh, so they were in Franklin, Kentucky working this project that they were almost finished with. And Jennifer and Adrian are at home. So while he's at work, Jennifer makes a phone call to her dad. This is confirmed with law enforcement. I don't have phone records, but they have given me this information. Um, Jennifer's dad recalls the same. She made a call to her dad at 11 o'clock on that Thursday, March 25th, and they spoke for maybe like 30 minutes or so. Um, Joe Benton tries to say that phone call was like two hours long and he used to write like this old topics forum. It was like an online chat room for, for small communities back in the day. So there's a lot of mixed information out there. Even I was giving out that information until I confirmed that with law enforcement in the last couple of years. Um, so the phone call was like 30 minutes long. She's telling her dad about everything that happened the night before. Uh, Jennifer was a daddy's girl, by the way. Um, even though he, she lived with us, all of my life. Jennifer's my half sister. We have different dads. Um, but she was a daddy's girl and she looks just like him. And she has two, three other sisters on her dad's side, by the way. So anyway, she's talking to him, telling him everything that happened the night before, all of the drama and everything. Um, and, and he recalls hearing like cartoons or like the TV or something playing in the background. And he says that someone approached Jennifer during their phone call and that Jennifer, he doesn't hear what they say. Sounds like a woman's voice, he says. There's only one woman that lives there, by the way. But he says, sounds like a woman's voice. And Jennifer says, stop, I'm talking to my dad. And then continues the conversation. So I guess that person leaves the room and she keeps talking about the events that happened the night before. And she tells her dad, like, I'm scared, dad. And he's like, of what? And she says, of Joey's mom. She's acting weird. Sorry. Okay, where it's, it's life. I know, I got two dogs. Um, so she tells her dad, like, Joey's mom is acting weird. And someone asked me the other day on one of my posts, like, did her dad not make like a follow up question at that time? Was he not like, what do you mean? Like, what's she doing? You know, and I don't know the answer to that question. To be quite honest with you, um, I have not spoken in depth with Jennifer's dad at all. I know my mom has. It's been 20 years and she remembers what she can. And I have what's written down in her journals at the time. Um, and he's reached out to me in like the last week or so with everything going on um, and just said, we really need to sit down and talk. And we do. Um, but all of this information is confirmed and true. Um, so what she was acting weird about, I don't know. Um, I maybe sort of have an idea after all of the events that happened in this last week or so, just from things that I'm being told and new leads and whatnot that are coming in. Um, so that was the last conversation that my sister had with anyone. That was the last confirmation that we have of her alive or Adriana. And after that, I always like to make sure everyone knows after this moment, everything is completely his story that makes it hearsay okay so joey's at work in franklin kentucky his truck was broken down at the time and they had another vehicle they they drove a ford explorer joey drove a ford ranger and so his truck was broken down in the shop 
So it wasn't even there. A Ford Explorer um, is kind of important uh, because Jennifer told her dad, I forgot this part, Justin. Jennifer told her dad on the phone, like, after she was like, his mom's acting weird. And he's like, well, why don't you have like your granny, your, it's his mom, come and get you or your mom or someone. And she's like, she's like, no, Joey's coming home soon and we're going to go on a picnic. And so I don't know if that picnic was already planned. If she spoke to him on the phone earlier in the day and was like, come home. And he was like, okay, we'll go on a picnic. Uh, I don't know the answers to those questions. Um, but she told her dad that on the phone. And so his family's got these two cars. I don't know where the Ford Explorer is that day. Is it with his mom in Gallatin where she works an hour away? Where's his dad? I don't know. Um, and we can talk about that. Joey is in Franklin. That is confirmed because he drove into work with my cousin because his truck was broke down. My cousin, Jeffrey, uh, gave him a ride, who's one of his, like, very best friends, very good friends at the time. That's actually how Jennifer and Joey met, is through my cousin um, while we were in Vegas. So, Jeffrey and Joey are working on the job, and Joey, and he takes the call, tells the foreman on the job that day, uh, I've got a family emergency, gotta go. So, he walks up to my cousin and is like, dude, we gotta go right now. So they get in the car and my cousin Jeffrey drives him back to his house. And I have spoken with my cousin and my cousin says he doesn't remember what they talked about on that ride home. Now, I don't know about you. Um, and and it, it has been 20 years. So I try to give people lots of grace. And, and the reason why I don't have more details is because one, I don't have any of the police reports. I don't have the original statements. I don't have access to them. I've tried the Freedom of Information Act. I've gotten denied because the case is open and active. But two, um, my family, after the case was changed to homicide in 2013, completely separated, uh, where my cousin is concerned and his mom and us, just because we're both um, I don't know. It almost kind of seemed like we all wanted the same thing. I know that deep down inside, but like we just, we couldn't get the support. Okay. So my cousin, 20 years later, I have the conversation with him finally. Okay. And he says he can't remember. So if it were me, that's what I was going to say a second ago. I don't know about you and everyone else that's watching. Um, if someone asked me to leave work early and I'm a young dude and this is how I make money and this is how I take my girlfriend out, um, you know, whatever. This is how I buy beer on the weekends. Um, if it were me, I'd be like, you know, like, why? What's going on? Do you need help with anything? Like, are you okay? Any questions. But I have nothing to go on there. Zero. Um, so he doesn't even remember like where he dropped him off. He, he says he doesn't remember if he, if they went back to my cousin's house and then someone came and picked him up. He doesn't remember if he drove him back to his home. Um, that is something else that I also have kind of gotten confirmation on in the past week, um, from someone who had a little bit more information that had just never told me, um, which we might talk about, uh, so, Joey got this call, this family emergency. I don't know what the emergency was. Um, he has never told about that call. And matter of fact, the only reason why, I believe the only reason why law enforcement knows about that call home is because my mom and my grandmother spoke to the foreman on the job that day and, the, and that guy um, told us. And so I believe that's the only reason why we know that um, other than my cousin being like, yeah, we left work early and I took him home, but not the family emergency, not the someone called him. And I don't know who called him. Um, where that phone call came from, I don't know. Did it come from his home phone, which they only had one of in the house, in their living room, in their like living room kitchen area. Like they had like kind of like a bar separating their kitchen. And so like yeah. the phone was right there at the bar. Um, 
or did it come from a cell phone in the house from his mom or his dad? If either one of them were home, I don't know. So, Justin, I believe whatever happened to my sister and my niece in these couple of hours from after she gets off the phone around 1130 with her dad and whenever Joey gets that emergency family emergency phone call and has to come home, which I don't know what time that was, um, you know, sometime in mid afternoon, whatever happened to my sister and my niece happened right there in that time. Um, I, do, I don't, do you, sorry. Do you, so sorry. I, I'm just, uh, I know that you don't have a lot of information from the police and stuff because you're not next of kin, but both her parents are like, your mom's alive, right? Yeah. If she doesn't and have his, information either. And her dad, like, will they not give them information? Because they would be next no. of kin. No. So with law enforcement and an open and active investigation, from what I'm told, this could be different for other counties. I don't know. Um, but our detectives, they do not share information with anyone. Um, so unless it's something that we already know and we're, and we're and we say it and then they will confirm it, they will not tell us any information. So we don't know what's in anyone's original statements, um, nothing about the phone records, nothing about where anyone was. Like I'm literally, we, my mom and I, my sister, uh, other pieces of our family, we're all just piecing it together ourselves, um, which is very difficult to do, especially 20 years later. Yeah. Um, so whatever happened to them, happened that afternoon and you know she told her dad that they were going on a picnic and um i don't know if they went on that picnic or not um i don't know if joey talked about that picnic in his statement i don't believe he did i think i've asked that question before and I, um i don't believe he mentioned that in his statement but her dad remembers it distinctly um, and Joe, his dad, and that old kind of chat room forum thing, he even brings up the picnic and says, my sister had prepared food to go on a picnic. So I feel like it was a thing, but I don't know if they ever made it on the picnic. Um, so, and here's the reason why. Because Joey comes home and remember everything from this point forward is hearsay. But in my mom's notes and from what she has told me over the years, uh, Joey tells her whenever they talk after the girls disappeared, she's like, Joey, like, tell me what happened that day. What do you remember? He's like, well, when I got home, Jennifer and Adriana were locked in their room. So I take that to mean that they were in there with the door locked on the inside. Um, I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means like they were locked in. Most locks don't work like that internal locks anyway. So, um, they were locked in their room. I don't know who from. I don't know what time Joey got home from work that day. So his mom, if she were at work that day, like, was she already home? You know, that would have made it around, you know, a five, four or five o'clock work day, then an hour drive home, uh, you know, so pretty late in the day. Uh, that's late to go on a picnic. Um, yeah. Sunset in March is around like seven o'clock you know, in between 6.30 and 7, like that's pretty late for a picnic, but maybe. Um, so he says he gets home, they're locked in the room and they go for a drive. He does not mention the picnic to my mom. Uh, he says they go for a drive. Now, I don't know what car they were in. I assume the Ford Explorer, that's, that's the car that I remember as a kid seeing Joey and Jennifer in anytime I saw them uh, because his truck, couldn't have the car seat in it. And so I assumed that. Uh, so they went for a drive and while they were out driving around, they were talking about things that had happened, you know, the night before and the fighting with his parents. And supposedly Jennifer wanted to move back. It was starting to get warm like it is now in Tennessee. And she wanted to move back into the barn and his parents said no. I don't know why they said no, but they said no. And so they're fighting about this. They decide to break up, he says. I don't know if it's like an amicable breakup uh, or if it's super heated. Like, I don't have any of those details, uh, but they decide to break up. They drive back to his parents' house, according to him, sit in the driveway. And my sister refuses to go back in the house, he says. 
said she won't get out of the car. So I guess she hates it so much, according to him, he won't go back in or she won't go back in. And then he says she just is like, take me to the gas station. So at this point, when he tells that to my mom, I'm like, like, why? <laughs> you know, like, did she already make plans with someone to pick her up? Did she make a phone call? Like, there's no record of that. Um, you know, and they're, I don't have their phone records, but like, he doesn't mention it. And no one else has come forward, obviously, and said it. So there's never been any confirmation to his story whatsoever. So apparently she looks at him and is like, take me to the gas station. And so he's like, okay. Uh, even though they just broke up, if I had just gone through a breakup, my husband's sitting right in the other room and we were fighting and we had just broken up. There ain't no way I'm driving him anywhere. So that's just my first opinion. I'm just throwing that out there for everyone listening to like, if we just fought and broke up, you can get your own ride somewhere. Okay. Um, so they get in the car. They live in Springfield. Owen Chapel community where they live is in Springfield, Tennessee, technically, but it's kind of like almost into cross plains. Not very far down the road, you, you're going to hit cross plains. So probably like a 10 minute drive and you're downtown cross plains, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. Um, and it's a bunch of back roads too. There's a couple different ways that you can take maybe like two routes into town, but he takes them into town and they stop at the food value, which was a grocery store that my boyfriend's family that I dated when I was a 16 year old at the time owned. Uh, so I know it very well. I know the people that work there very well. We all did. It was a small town. There were three people working that night. He says Jennifer got out of the car, went into the food value. He assumes to make a phone call. So I guess this is where he's like putting in his story. This is where she sets up her ride. Um, so the grocery store and where he's taking them next, the Exxon gas station is three minutes down the road. So unless someone was just super close by and could drive over real quick, I don't know how she could have made a phone call and then went there, you know, and they were ready to pick her up. You know? Did you mention on this too? I don't know if you said it, I'm sorry. And I missed it. It's okay. That when they went on this drive, they didn't have anything for the baby oh, or yeah. for no, her? There was nothing. They took none of their belongings. None of them. No car seat, no diaper bag, not my sister's wallet. My sister wore eyeglasses. Uh, not that. Um, none of their clothes, toothbrushes. Um, my, my, my niece had like a baby, like a little tiny Elmo stuffed toy. It was her favorite. My mom actually has it tattooed on the back of her leg. Like that's how much she liked Elmo. They didn't take it. Um, not Adriana's only jacket. Okay. So Jennifer didn't have no money. So some people are like, what? She only had one jacket. She only had one jacket. Like this is a low income young single mother. She had one jacket. Um, probably didn't pay for it. I don't think she did. So we were very aware that we got that back. They didn't take it. Um, her little shoes and things like that, just literally anything. Um, so yeah. So none of the people in the in the food value see my sister. There were three people working that night. There was kind of an older gentleman who worked there for years and years and years. He was kind of like their manager. Um, and he sat behind like this window. It wasn't like grocery stores these days where they have like that glass you can't see through. There's literally an open window. So no glass or nothing. You can just talk to him and like, you know, sit right there and have a conversation. So if she had to use the phone, she had to get it from him. His name was Mr. Bell. Um, and he would be sitting back there. He never saw her. She never asked to use the phone. There was a cashier and a bagger working that night. They said hardly anyone came in that night, so they would remember if they come in there. They didn't see them. So Jennifer comes back out, and he drives them to the gas station the three, maybe five minutes down the road, um, depending on how fast they drive. On that route, they, they're on that main strip, that main road. On that route, they pass my house my mom's house. Um, and remember, 
we were on good terms. My mom had just talked to her the night before. Like, if my sister needed a safe place to go, she would have stopped at her aunt's house, which is also on the main road closer to their house. They would have passed by it. Um, she would have called her granny, who she's very, very close to, who lives just a little bit further away in Springfield. But on the route he says he took, he passed two family members' houses. Okay, so he passed our house, went to this Exxon gas station. It's at exit 112 in Cross Plains um, off of I-65 going north. It's exit 112 going into Cross Plains. If you're going towards Cross Plains off of that exit, there's a Sad Sands on one side. It's big, huge, says fireworks. Um, and then on the other side is where this Exxon gas station was. It's now just an empty parking lot. The Exxon is gone. Um so the girl working that night at the gas station knew my sister personally, went to school with her, um, you know, was up front at the cashier. She worked alone that night, was up front at the uh, cash register all night, says, tells my mom when my mom went to speak to her and says, Jennifer was not here. She said, I would have seen her right out the window, right where he says they were. So he says that he pulled up to the Exxon, let them out of the car without any of their things, drove across the street, directly across the street is a church. Now, they don't have a parking lot that's facing the gas station. They're kind of like perpendicular is the word. Um, but apparently he went over there and sat for like 10 minutes in his car um, and waited for someone to pick them up. Someone pulls up in a white car and she gets in it, Jennifer and Adriana get into it. And Joey just is like, cool, someone's here. And he leaves. He doesn't see who the people are. He can't make out the make and model of the car. He just knows it's white and four door. And then he doesn't see which way they went. Okay, so if, according to his story, if there's any truth to it, they're right near the interstate. Um, you know, so that's a potential... Um, you know, as far as Jennifer's friends who drive a white car, there was uh, a couple um, that she hung out with. She had a girlfriend and a dude that that girlfriend dated had a white car. They're really the only people that we know that had a white car. And they did have a white Camaro. Uh, of course, it's not four door. Um, and we can talk about the police statement, but that hasn't happened quite yet in the story. Um, anyways, that's what he says happened on Thursday evening. I guess he goes back to his house that night, uh, after the breakup and I don't know, he never thinks about my sister again, <laughs> uh, which is not likely for anyone in a breakup scenario. Um, so the next day, Friday, the 26th. Uh, of course, my mom didn't hear from Jennifer on Thursday, only her dad. The next day on Friday, the 26th, uh, my mom is starting to get worried. She hadn't heard from Jennifer. It's not like too uncommon for Jennifer to go, you know, a day or two without hearing or Jennifer to go a day or two without calling my mom. So my mom's like, mm. but like Friday, whenever she gets home from work, uh, she's calling around asking, have you talked to Jennifer? No. Calls Joey's cell phone, no answer. Calls the Benton home, no answer. Calls Jennifer's grandmother, who she talks to literally all the time, uh, haven't heard from her. So my mom tells her granny, okay, well, if you talk to her, call me immediately. Like we're looking for her. Tell her to call her mom. Um, and then calls my aunt, you know, starts calling all of these people. Literally no one has heard from Jennifer, which that is the uncommon part. So even if she didn't talk to my mom in a day, a day and a half, uh, she would have spoken with someone. And if not a family member, a friend. Jennifer was stuck at home with this baby. She didn't have a job. Um, there was no one else there really to talk to. And if anyone knows when you're around children literally all day, like you need adult interaction. So my sister would pick up the phone and call. And no one had heard from her. And... So my mom's starting to get worried and her granny calls my mom back and says, Kathy, that's my mom's name, by the way. Her name is Kathy Holloway at the time. Her name is Kathy Nail now. Uh, so if you see that difference in reports, same person. Um, but her granny calls my mom and says, 
Kathy, Jennifer's missing. No one can get in touch with her. Something's wrong. And so from that point forward, it's just, it's just a literal nightmare. Like I can't, like there's not any words. Like people always ask me to try and describe it. Like I, I still feel stuck in that moment. I don't know how to describe that feeling, but it was 20 years ago and I still feel stuck there. And, I, and there's not a word for it. All I can use to describe it is panic. Uh, that's the best word. And just, just a freaking nightmare. Um, but yeah, at that point, we're all just calling everyone we know. Um, I heard from a friend of mine. I heard from so many people that I haven't heard from in 15, you know, years in the past week because of the new things that are going on. And, you know, they're just telling me about their memories. They're like, I still remember you calling me. So I'm 16 years old. I'm calling my friends who Jennifer would never hang out with, you know, but we literally, I'm telling you that to let you know, we called everyone and she was nowhere. Um, my middle sister, I haven't mentioned her yet. I have a middle sister. I'm the baby. Jennifer's the oldest. And my middle sister, Heather, at the time was 18. She was about to graduate high school but she and my mom drove all over cross plains very small town but the places that they thought jennifer might be with this friend or with that friend nothing everyone is blowing up the benton household phone their one phone and joey's cell phone no answer from either one of them all night finally joey picks up the phone on friday evening uh, my sister heather got him on the phone and she's like where's my sister and he's like, we broke up. I don't know where she is. Um, at that same exact time, Joey was having a bonfire at his house, which was a very common thing, by the way. They had a lot of fires at the barn. Um, they called it a party barn. So the same barn that you showed earlier that they lived in, um, that's where all their friends would hang out, you know, before Jennifer and Adriana, too. That's just where they would all gather. They would have a fire, party, drink, whatever they were doing um, at the time. But he was having a bonfire. The day after whatever happened to my sister, he was having a bonfire with some friends. It was a couple's thing. So my sister was supposed to be there. My cousin and his girlfriend were there. And Joey's other best friend, John, and his girlfriend were there. And um, Jeffrey, my cousin, asked Joey that night at the same, around the same time he tells my sister, we broke up, I don't know where she's at. He tells my cousin Jeffrey, she's at a friend's house. Jeffrey's like, where's Jennifer? She's supposed to be here. She's at a friend's house. So already at that point in time, we're getting conflicting stories about what's happened. Um, my personal opinion is that's just because they haven't had time to get their story straight yet. Um, because I believe it is all a story. And I haven't confirmed that yet, but that's what I believe in my heart. Um, so there's another important piece for Friday. I, I can't skip this part, Justin. Uh, I think I covered it in my videos on TikTok earlier too, um, but it's important. The gas station is not the last place that Joey says he sees Jennifer. It is the last place he says that he sees Adriana. Because he says Jennifer comes back to his parents' house the next day. So Joey worked on that Friday and they finished up their job early that day. Remember, it's construction. And so I guess the project was done and they were like, go home. So they worked a couple of hours. Joey says he was home around midday. Jennifer shows up to their house. He's laid out on the couch trying to relax, um, sees the car pull up. Jennifer gets out. She's alone. He knows that. Sees the car, says it's the exact same white car that picked her up the night before. So a four, a four door white car. Uh, can't make out what make and model those still and can't even suggest one. Uh, says Jennifer comes in, grabs a change of clothes and some things and asks for her income tax refund money. Now, my sister did not have a bank account. She hadn't worked yet in 2004, but in 2003, I guess she had like a small job. A lot of times she worked 
third shift. That way she could share a vehicle with my mom. So I guess she had some kind of part-time job in 2003. I had a small income tax refund money, about 500 bucks, uh, deposited into his parents' bank account because the only other option is to wait on your check in the mail. And that was a faster option. So she did that. So she comes in there, she asks Joey, you know, can I get my money? And he's like, my parents aren't home. So were they at work? I don't know. Uh, Joe has said that he was in court that day because they were in the middle of some sort of court battle with someone trying to steal something from them. Um, but his parents weren't home. She's like, all right, I'll come back tomorrow to get it. Okay, that's important. And I brought it up because I was talking about Friday night. That happened Friday midday, but the bonfire and everything was happening at night and us calling Joey. And then my Aunt Lisa gets a phone call to her house because they had a good relationship. Even though they didn't like my mom and my family, um, my cousin and his mom still had a decent relationship. So did my sister's grandparents. They still had a decent relationship with the Bentons at this time. And so he called my aunt, he, Joe Benton, Joey's dad, called my aunt and left her a voicemail message on her answering machine. Yes, we had answering machines then. Um, not everyone had cell phones and whatnot, but um, left a voicemail and said, I heard Jennifer was wanting her income tax refund money. I've got it to give it to her. Let her know. So one of my big questions is, you know, why are you calling around asking to give Jennifer her income tax refund when she literally said earlier that day, according to your son, mm -hmm. that she would be back tomorrow to get it. Okay. Maybe you're just being extra nice. Fine. Okay. So all of that happened on Friday. Everyone is gathering at my house. Everyone is in literal panic talking about what happened, not sure what to do. Um, we decided to call the, call the police. Can't find her anywhere. It's time to call the police. And this is like in the wee hours of the morning on Saturday. No one sleeps. No one eats. Nothing like that. Like there's no time. Like we're just looking for her and Adriana. And so we call the police and they come to our house. We're telling them everything that's happening. We're super, you know, upset. And um, he takes a report. And we tell him, you know, we're concerned about Jennifer. Like, the home that they're living in is not a good environment. Drugs, guns, uh, about the fight that had happened, about the things that had happened in the past, all of these red flags. We tell him about all of that, you know, like, can you please go there and check on her? Okay. So we continue, continue looking and whatnot. On Friday evening, okay, before we called the police, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit and I'm sorry. It's hard to like spit out everything exactly the way it occurred. Um, no, don't be sorry. It's, it's a, it's a really, I mean, it's a lot. You're covering 20 years in a short period of time. And I think you're doing fantastic. Just, thank so you. you know, like you really are. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's very, I hate to use the word captivating, but it's very captivating. Okay. So. Um, uh, okay. I hope everyone can follow me, I guess is what I hope. Um, so on Friday evening after his dad makes that phone call and it's like, I've got your money. Uh, let me know. Um, you know, we're all looking for Jennifer. So my aunt calls him back, you know, and she's like, we can't find Jennifer. Where is she? This is when the story comes out. This is when Joey starts telling his story that he dropped him off at the gas station. Joey and his dad, Joe brings Joey because he had been drinking and couldn't drive himself, you know, and deal with his own problems over to my aunt's house. They come over to my aunt's house and they start telling this story. And while they're there, he's like, you know, a white four door car picked him up. And the only friend we know that has the white four door car, my aunt's like, yeah, that's, that's who it's got to be. You know, she's like, I know where they're at. And so those people are Jerry and Helga. Okay. And so she's like, okay, we'll check with them. So my aunt tells my mom that. And first thing my mom does is go to Dollar General, the same one that we met at, you know, earlier that week. My mom met Jennifer there to do the butt butter right there in town. Helga works there. So that's why she went there. Um, Helga's out of town. Helga and her boyfriend are. Uh, they race cars, like small town race cars, like on like old Highland Rim, if you're from the area, Speedway <laughs> kind of race cars. But they were out of town. I don't know exactly where they were racing. 
but they were out of town. So my mom leaves a message and she's like, um, soon as she gets in, like have her call me. Someone said that's where she's at. So Saturday morning, Helga and Jerry come rolling up in our driveway. And this is what prompts us to make, to call the police. Helga and Jerry come rolling up in our driveway with truck and trailer with a race car on the trailer in tow. Pull up in our driveway. My mom saying, you know, this is what's happening. He said that, that she's got to be with you. And Helga says, no, uh, if he said that, something is definitely wrong. We haven't seen Jennifer since November. So at that point in time, my mom was like, like, that's it. You know, that's whenever the cops, you know, were like, okay, there's no one else. Call the cops. He gets a statement. So this is kind of happening throughout Saturday. We're all still freaking out, still looking for her too. We're not just sitting around, like we're still calling around, driving around, that sort of thing. Um, past boyfriends, like we're checking with them, you know, because Jennifer had been in some relationships before. Uh, the baby's dad, uh, who we thought was the dad at the time, things like that. So Saturday is the day we make the missing persons report. Uh, the report's actually filed, uh, according to the police report, at 638. And I don't know if they, like, retroactively go back and do that. So I don't know exact times that he was at our house and then went over there. But he's like, okay, I'm going to go over to do a welfare check, the officer that, that showed up. Uh, at this time, I'm calling him Officer C. And that's because I have yet to talk to him myself, to hear for myself uh, what happened. But he goes over to the Benton residence on Saturday, shows up. Joey answers the door. And his parents aren't home. And he gets a statement from Joey. He gets the gas station story. And Joey says, I dropped him off at a gas station. Okay, let me back up. In the police report, I've read it over and over in the last week. In the police report, at first, he says, I, I dropped her at a friend's house. And then that changes. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I dropped her off at the gas, at the Exxon. And the officer notes, he asks which one. Joey says he can't remember. And then it finally comes to him. And he tells him which one. And then he says a white four-door Camaro or Mustang shows up at the gas station to pick up Jennifer and Adriana. That vehicle does not exist. And I just want to say something right here, Justin, because a lot of people get hung up on this. And I do want you to get hung up on the details. I absolutely do because they're important. They're important because it's a story and they were fumbling with their story. That's why it's important. That car doesn't exist. And he later changed it just to a white four-door car. And that car, I'll make note, is one of the most common vehicles out driving on the road. Okay. And I believe that that's the reason why that's the description of the car. Uh, that is in the original police report. Uh, that report was later changed because his dad went up to the Robertson County Sheriff's Department and basically freaked out on them and was like, he wouldn't say that. He owns a Mustang. He actually owned two. He was like, he knows that doesn't exist. So what he was saying that night, why he said a car that doesn't exist, I have no idea. Um, his parents were not home. So he said, if you want to come in here, because the officer said, you know, I'm, I'm getting this information. I need to come in and look around and check for Jennifer and Adriana to do a well, a well, welfare check. And he says, you know, my parents aren't home. If you want to come in, you need to come back with a warrant. Shuts the door. And so, of course, the officer's like, typically, whenever someone doesn't just invite you in, uh, there's something wrong. So he drives, you know, the however many minutes, 15 minutes back over to our house, 15, 20, shows up at our house and tells my mom, I went over there, Kathy, something's not right. He's like, I'm calling it in. I've got to, I've got to turn this over to my superiors, get the detectives involved. So officer C 
calls in. They put a bolo out, be on the lookout for Jennifer and Adriana. We filed the, mis the official missing persons report at 6.38 p.m. Um, and then that's kind of the end of like, it's definitely not the end, it's been 20 years, but that's kind of the end of like all of me hashing out what happened that week. Um, after that, you know, my mom has written down in her notes and I try so hard not to look backwards. Okay. That's something really important to me because I feel like I look backwards a lot anyways, because I have to, because of the case. But as far as how the case was handled in the beginning, it was mishandled. And a lot of the, the detectives that are on our case today, uh, a lot of them that were on it then will agree. Okay. Things were so much different than in 2004, you know, we didn't, and it's a small town and, and so I'm not making excuses. I don't make excuses at all for the mishandling of it. But my mom has in her notes that when officer C called in, um, to tell the detectives and report this and say, you know, we need help. Something's not right. They were like, okay, put it on our desk. We'll be in Monday. And it was Saturday. And what happened to my sister happened on Thursday. And so we are already, we're, we're, we're two days too late. And then, and then now they said, put it on our desk. We'll be in on Monday. And then that would be four days, four days too late. And so, you know, without accusing anyone, if something happened to my sister and my niece, which I believe it did on Thursday that afternoon, um, they have time to make up a story. They have time to think it through, talk it through, get their story straight before they come over to my aunt's house, before and they- And destroy evidence, and destroy evidence. Destroy evidence, dispose of anything. Um, you know, potentially that's the reason why he wouldn't let them in that night. You know, maybe the reason he wouldn't let them in that night is because they have guns laying around. Uh, I don't know, illegal ones, drugs. I don't know, but, and I can't ask him, <laughs> he won't talk to me. So, um, yeah, I don't know, but I try not to look backwards at those things, but that one detail right there, put it on my desk, which they did not do. Okay. So on Sunday, they actually come and do a walkthrough of the house the very next day. Okay. According to Robertson County Sheriff's department, um, and thing and notes that they have shared with me, they come back the next day and they do a walkthrough. It is a consented walkthrough. That's very important for everyone to know. It is a permissible search. There is no search warrant. They are invited into the home. So do what you want with that information. Um, again, it's been three and a half days at that point. Um, you know, I also want to note that they potentially could have gone on the picnic. Um, you know, if Jennifer pre prepared food, she mentioned it to her dad, they could have gone on the picnic. Where that picnic might have taken place, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of places. This is a very rural country area. A lot of back roads, a lot of ponds, a lot of like little hangout spots in the woods for teenagers to hang out and, you know, swim in a water hole. Um, just things like that. And I'm like, where's the picnic? I don't know. But he doesn't mention it in his statement. And so, you know, if we're if we're believing him, he was the last person to see my sister on Friday. Where what? So where is uh, Adriana's biological father in all of this? Is he involved yeah. at all? He is um, in the past week or so. I keep them updated. They are family to us. Um, and, and I'll say, I actually enjoy connecting with them. I think they'll agree. Um, just because like, it makes me feel closer to my sister and Adriana. Um, because she looks a lot like her dad. Um, his, he, his name is Billy and, uh, he still lives in Springfield Greenbrier area not too far. And he actually, when Jennifer and Adriana disappeared, he didn't know that he was Adriana's dad. So, you know, my sister being a young mother, 
relate to it or don't, I will stand behind my sister. Some people like to talk crap. Okay. But being a young mom, when she had Adriana, she thought she knew who the dad was. She was in between boyfriends at the time. Um, so do what you want with that information, but she didn't know who the dad was. There was actually a, a guy named Charles who was there at the hospital when Adriana was born. He signed Adriana's birth certificate. Um, I believe at the time my sister was trying to collect child support or the court was gonna make him pay it or something and they ordered a paternity test. This is right before they disappeared, early 2004, late 2003 maybe. Um, so they got this paternity test and um, turns out he wasn't the dad. And so the only other person it could have been uh, from what I'm told from my sister's cousin, Ashley, who's like one of her best friends, they were at the fairgrounds one night, run into Billy, Adriana's dad. Um, and that's whenever Jennifer told him that night that he was Adriana's dad and, um, and he would have been a good one. So, uh, he is involved now. Um, and he lets me do all of the talking, but I know he would be on this video with me if I asked him to. Uh, he found out he was Adriana's dad after Jennifer and Adriana disappeared because they had went, and Jennifer and Billy had went and got um, their own paternity test results. And he didn't have them at the time uh, that they disappeared, but he got them afterwards. And so, you know, that's something I think about, like how hard... You know, it's hard for me and my other sister and Jennifer's other sisters and, our, and her immediate family, but it affects so many more people. Um, Adriana has siblings, <laughs> some younger ones that look like her and uh, it's wild. But yeah, we were robbed of a lot of things like that, but he's still here. Uh, um, so fast forwarding 20 years later, there was just this past week a search warrant or a warrant executed on that house. And I'm kind of confused on it. Based on what I read, it looks like it's in connection to the case, but then I've seen things online that say it's not in connection to the case. It's something different. So what yeah. are you allowed to say on that? Okay. Thank you for asking it like that. Because the first thing I like to say is, is that I've worked really, really hard the past couple of years to reestablish a good relationship with our TBI agent and Robertson County Sheriff's Department. Um, I know you mentioned in your live video earlier today, and I'll just kind of reiterate, in the past couple years, we got a new detective on the case. I worked really close with that detective. Um, and then just in the past, like six months or so, we've been reassigned another detective. Um, the current Robertson County Sheriff's detective, uh, he has been a part of the team. They kind of like make sure many people know about it. So he was well versed as far as our case. The TBI agent has been on our case for years. Um, and, and we have a really good team currently. Okay. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I work really hard to establish that I won't do anything that affects their work. Um, of course. So as far as the search warrant, Wednesday last week, I start getting calls, messages through social media, people I don't know, people that live in, in the Owen Chapel community, neighbors and such. And they're like, what's going on over there? I had already been started making posts for Jennifer and Adriana's 20 year anniversary of their disappearance. And so, you know, people were seeing them, you know, the locals that follow the case and whatnot. And so they reached out to me and they're like, what's going on? Um, sent me some pictures. There's like, 30 police cars there, the SWAT team's there, ATF is there. Um, I mean, just a huge unmarked car, so many state troopers just lined up and down the road right there and at their home. Now, when I say their home, earlier in the live, I talked, Jennifer and Adriana lived with his parents in that small brick house at the time they disappeared. And his parents were planning to build and had already started like the foundation septic work and whatnot. And, concrete which we can talk about they had started all of that around the time the girls disappeared um so that new house is the house that they live in currently joey lives there too he may have lived some other places but I, to my knowledge he lives there with them still as a 40 year old man and 
There's nothing wrong with that if you live at home, by the way. Um, but they, all the police presence was outside. People were showing me pictures and whatnot. And uh, I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I haven't heard from anyone yet. At that point in time, I had not heard from our agent or detective. And so I'm like, you know, texting these people back. Like, what do you know? What do you see? You know, we log into Robertson County Sheriff's Department online to their booking system and their like logs to see like if any of them had been, you know, had been in jail recently. And Joey's dad was in jail. He had been in there since I think early March. He's got a couple of charges against him right now for violation of probation and one for domestic assault. Uh, you can't see a lot of details about what that's for, although I do have information from people about what it's for. It does come from inside their home uh, with with their family. So it's not a domestic against like a neighbor or some random person. So that's all I can give there. But what all of the police were there for that day, of course, at this point, I'm like, is it, are they there for my sister? Are they there for Adriana? Like, do they find them? You know, I don't expect like if something huge happens like that, like our agent and detective just to drop what they're doing right there and call me, you know, um, I want them to first do their job and then call me immediately as soon as you can yeah. um, kind of thing. So I didn't know what was happening, but I just wanted to get there as soon as possible. All of everyone else who kind of follows and supports my family just started showing up there. And so I started getting videos, people driving by and, you know, um, they could see Joey outside, like walking around, like showing where certain things were on the property. Um, couldn't see his mom, Cindy, anywhere. And then his sister, Amy, uh, we haven't talked about her yet, but his sister, Amy, and her family live in that old brick house that they lived in at the time they disappeared right next door. Um, so didn't I didn't know where they were. But, you know, I get there eventually. I'm, I'm telling you, it's not till like six o'clock and everyone is like blowing up my phone and I get there and the news crews are there and I start talking to them and I don't really know anything at this time. Um, before I get there, I do speak to TBI and Robertson County. They do tell me, yes, we have a search warrant. Um, yes, it is for that property and house. Um, and they say it's unrelated to your case. Okay. Um, so I don't know if they told me then or if they told me later if it was unrelated. But anyways, we find out that the search warrant warrants unrelated. But while we're out there, um, the fire department and the ATF people walk over from their house. We're at like this little chapel church like right down the road where we used to have like prayer vigils for jennifer and adriana and they're walking over to us and they start pushing people back and like the neighbors are all out with us um and they start pushing people back and they're like y'all gotta back up um you gotta back up to like i think it was like 1700 feet perimeter or something like that they're evacuating the neighbors uh or asking them to anyone who's within that perimeter to scoot back and they were gonna have to push us back past the four-way stop at one point they were blocking the roads at one point too so no one could come um so the fire department was like yes there's explosive material that's been found so who whoever the fire department guy was that came over he was like yes there's explosive material and they're worried you know for y'all's safety so whatever it was it was big enough to maybe explode um, in that 1700 foot perimeter. So I stayed there until about like nine o'clock, 9.30 at night. Um, you know, just kind of talking to everyone and trying to get as much information as I could. And, you know, Joey's other family members live on like the road right next to theirs. Their properties all back up to each other. Um, and have like conjoining pieces of land. Um, so I just kind of wanted to like stay and, and get that up close and personal information. But around like 930, the cars start leaving a little bit at a time and um, a truck and trailer pulls out of the church parking lot that we were in and pulls up to the house and they start loading what looks like like big trash bags in a wagon. They pulled a big wagon 
down the driveway. It's kind of like a little bit of slope. And they were full of like these big trash bags. What was in them? I don't know. But they load them into the truck. That truck and trailer goes on. I go home for the night. Okay. And then I hear that whatever they took, whatever explosive materials and whatnot, I actually heard this not from law enforcement, but from a journalist that had followed up with ATF, um, that it they took the explosive materials or whatever it was to um, a landfill nearby and set it off, whatever it was. And there's a lot of people who heard it. And I assume that it's the same noise that they're hearing as what they're talking about at the landfill because it's people who live close by. Um, so... To my understanding, they were not there for the explosive material. Um, they were there for something else unrelated uh, to our case and unrelated to the bombs or explosive material, whatever they found. And they just happened to find the explosive material whenever they got there. And then that just kind of like derailed what they were there for that day. Um, that's what I am aware of. Um, law enforcement has not told me that this is just from coming from the people who came over to push us back and the journalist information. Um, they're not going to tell me what they're there for until they can tell me, which is whenever they bring charges. Um, so because I know that Joey, Cindy and Amy, the other Benton family, that close knit family there are all there that day walking around or I heard that Cindy and Amy left the residence earlier that day when they found the explosive material because they're there and not arrested, even though they're finding explosive material on their property. I can only assume that the person that they're saying these belong to is the one that's in jail. And his next co uh, court hearing is on April 5th. So that's either Thursday or Friday. So coming up this week. Um, that's all I know, Justin. I don't know. Now, when I say that's all I know, that's all I can share. Um, I do know little bits and pieces of what the warrant could potentially be for. Law enforcement can't confirm that with me. These are from credible people who are very, very close to, I can't tell you how close, um, so I know that what I know is at least accurate. If not what they were there for, it is a piece of the puzzle. And whenever that information does come out, I think a lot of people will, I think it'll shock a lot of people. Um, but I'm looking around because I'm searching for my words and I don't want to say something I can't. Um, I get that. I think it will shock a lot of people, but I think a lot of people will not be surprised. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and will it relate to Jennifer and Adriana in our case? I hope so. I feel like it could, but will it? I don't know. So that's a lot. Thank you for sharing all of that. That's, that's a lot. You did phenomenal on that, just so you know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I know it can't be easy to have to share that and relive all that. So I, I appreciate it. I appreciate you letting me, you know, use my platform to amplify it. Yeah. All of that. You. Yeah. All of that said, um, so you have a new detective. They've served, they've served a warrant unrelated to your case, unrelated to explosive, but they found explosives. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that about the time of the disappearance, they were doing some construction with concrete, correct? Is there, has anybody done any scans of the concrete? So is that a hot button issue? <laughs> <laughs> um, for years and years and years and years, that has been, I don't want to call it a rumor because I'm not quite sure that it is, uh, especially with all of the leads that I've gotten in the last week. Um, and when I say all of them, I mean, I have a lot and most of them have to do with concrete uh, on their property. Now, can cadaver dogs sniff through concrete? I don't know. According to law enforcement, there was a scent dog 
run on the property on that Monday after their disappearance. So after that first walkthrough on Sunday, there was a scent dog that ran the old house property. So that little brick house, not the new house, not the five acres next door. I wasn't there. I can't confirm that. Um, but according to my mom's notes, that's what was done. Okay. So at the time that the girls disappeared, they were pouring foundation. They were pouring um, or digging for septic. And I do have information about them digging for septic. And it's public information. So just here goes. <laughs> um, but at the time, they had dug septic lines without any permits. They had not pulled any permits for doing their house or anything like that. Okay. So where they dug the septic lines um, and did not pull the permit, they don't use that septic system. It was never used. Interesting. There is another septic system on their property that they do use. The old one, there is concrete poured on top of it and a building sits on top. For so, a septic tank, that's not really, because if you have an issue with it, putting concrete in a building is not good. You're not even supposed to like drive any, like a lawnmower over those things. Yeah. We got work done so recently that's... at our house and no one could park on top of it. Yeah. They're like, be careful driving over it. No, this septic system was never used. Um, and I have like where the field lines were drawn, like on this little map from anyone can pull it up if they you know, can use the internet, but I talked to the inspector guy who went out there to like check it after it was reported that they hadn't done their permits and everything. He went out there to check it and he was like, yeah, this is where they were and this is where they are now. I have both of them, have both maps. Um, so that's always been an interesting thing. All of that was being done at the time that the girls disappeared. And so concrete comes up a lot. You asked, have they x-rayed the concrete? Law enforcement has done four, I believe four searches, um, or at least set four searches up. The first walkthrough, um, the scent dog coming through on that Monday. There was one in 2006, I think, where THP, which is Tennessee Highway Patrol, yeah. came out and offered their services. Um, and I think it was them that also offered the volunteers, but they did like a line search I don't know exactly where because it's not our search. So I don't have maps for it. I don't know what they found. I don't know anything like that. But obviously, if they found Jennifer and Adriana, we'd know. Um, so I don't know exactly where they searched. But a line search is like they walk through the woods. You might have seen it in Summer Wells' case, um, like three feet apart. And they like prod down in with these like metal probe things like down into the uh, ground. Okay, so that turned up nothing. There was a pond drained during that search. I believe it was during that one. Um, there was another search that was set up and where, I mean, people come from all over, all agencies, all search teams and everything. And Joey's dad called it off after everyone was already there, ready to go because media showed up. So there's only one other search that law enforcement um, has made known to me and they have... I don't want to disrespect them, but I'm just going to say what I know. They have searched and x-rayed the concrete pillars that are the structure support system underneath their home that they had the search warrant for the other day. Um, there's different types of foundations. This particular foundation has block columns underneath it. Those columns were supposedly x-rayed. Um, Justin, I have documentation from the team that supposedly did the x-rays. Uh, and they say this, they say that's not true. Uh, I don't know, but to, I was talking to my mom the other day and I was like, maybe these are two different searches. Maybe they brought their own team out. I don't know how or why, but I, I literally have letters from the team of people and the doctors, their doctor 
so and so who say no we did not do that that day and they also say we were only allowed to search certain areas of the property because it's a permissible search so uh, they said we didn't get to do anything that day so i don't know if that's true or not and i say that not to question law enforcement just because i have conflicting information um so whenever you say have they x-rayed the concrete all of it no i don't know if anyone who's watching has seen the aerial photo of their house the other day there are multiple structures on that property at the time the girls disappeared though um just the house and just that big red barn sitting right next to it um which both have concrete underneath the, the reason that i was asking that too is there was a, a case very recently where the prime primary suspect died and his wife basically said, you give me immunity. I'll tell you everything I know since he was dead. And I think yeah. that it was a relationship where she was too scared to say anything. And she told him where she thought they were and they had just built a house um, or a new driveway or something. I forget what it was at the time that at the time that they, this girl went missing, they were building the house or building a driveway and the police had to go like and say, look, we need to move your house. <laughs> and, <laughs> Like, I know you just built this. I know you just finished whatever, but we need to move it. And yeah. uh, we think that there could be a body under your house. And they did. And there was. Interesting. Yeah. And they saw, and if I can find that case, I'll shoot you the article over. I'll text it to you. Okay. Um, but it, it was very interesting. Um, and I, it's just, you know, you have construction involving concrete, a septic system that's not being used. You know, those tank, the septic tanks are huge, right? Um, you could put somebody under it and then put it on top of it. And you're already pretty deep because you got the machinery. There's just, I mean, that's where my mind goes, you know, right. hearing and this. How, I'm sure your mind's gone there. Yeah, of course. And how deep down does a body have to be where a cadaver dog can't, doesn't smell it? You know, well, at, you, you have to have an x-ray. You have to go over. And I don't know if anyone watching this has ever seen those x-ray machines, but it's not like a lawnmower. Um, you know, you're not just pushing it over very fast. It's not like a vacuum. You know, it's a very slow thing. And you have to, like, methodically, like, put it on. Uh, we used it a couple years ago in a different search we did in 2021 on uh, Joey's granddad's property. And I mean, it's very methodical. You have to like literally sit it right there and like type stuff into it. And it's like, it's difficult, um, you know? And so they would have to do that like on every square inch of like this gigantic garage that's full of crap, you know? And so it's like, we can't do those kinds of things without a warrant. And we just never had one because there's no evidence, physical evidence in our case, you know? So I, I was looking real quick. So a septic tank usually is between uh, about four to eight feet, I guess, maybe underground um, where they bury it. Maybe I think eight feet is kind of a stretch for like a very, very, very big tank. Cadaver dogs, a well-trained cadaver dog can smell greater, greater than 10 feet. Okay. So if, if they would just take one in there, then maybe we could, but they, but they just can't. But at 20 years, 20 years from now, you know, later you, I mean, not to be graphic, but I mean, you, you know, the reality That's of what okay. you're dealing with here. You're, you're, you're talking about skeletal remains right? at this point. There's not going to be anything, you know, there's not going to be much left to smell. Um, right. So I don't, I mean, I don't know how that works. Maybe the dogs can still pick it up, but it just seems, I, I just, to me, it, I don't understand why a judge wouldn't sign off on a pretty decent warrant to tear up some of this stuff. I don't know either. Um, I can tell you common sense plays no part in oh, our justice system. Um, fair. And I am told that a lot whenever I call our detective and uh, our agent and they're just like, I know it makes sense. I feel the same way, but we have to do it this way, you know? So I know how angry it makes people. It makes us just as angry. Um, what makes me the most angry is that other than the mishandling of the case in the beginning that would have possibly kept this from going on 20 years. <laughs> other than that, what makes me the most angry is that literally the person that last saw them tells you a story that could potentially be a story, but in his story even, 
even if it's not true and one of them killed them that day you know and disposed of them somewhere even if it's not true his story he gave places my sister in their home the last time anyone saw them and so they're just trusting that my sister got back in her car and drove away in whoever's car that was and just drove away and i guess just i don't know dissipated like i don't know i guess her car just vanished got taken by an alien like what no like that's not a thing you can't just trust the person that last saw them you know to me that makes me the most angry because to me that is enough for a warrant and i honestly justin i feel like in other cases that is enough for a warrant in other cases yeah. they do look the last place they were seen you know and i think especially with the sketchiness especially when there's sketchiness going yeah. on and you have and you know inconsistent stories and somebody can't keep it straight and i mean right. let's be real in all these cases um, well 98 percent of these cases it's always the boyfriend or the husband right you know i in our case which i know i hear that all the time in a lot of true crime of course now i'm like completely into true crime of course this one being my biggest focus um but in all of the cases that I've listened to, a lot of times it is a spouse, significant other, whatever. In our case, I'm not so sure. Um, I know just, what you're saying. Just because three people lived in the house at the time. Her boyfriend was at work that day. And so many people tell me that he loved them. Um, my mom was telling me a story the other day that my aunt ran into him in a store like in town somewhere and just was talking to him like shortly after the girls disappeared and he pulled out a picture of Adriana out of his wallet and was like, I didn't do it. I promise you I didn't do it. Pulled out a picture, showed it to her. And so when I hear things like that and I see that stupid wooden horse rocking horse and i think about the toddler bed that he made i mean the only way he would have done it is just like which happens in some of these cases is completely snapping or if drugs are involved um you know or as or as what was alluded to at the beginning of the, if there was sexual assault something. and you know it's yeah that is a potential and she confronted them or something like that. That's definitely been on our radar, definitely come up um, in the past and currently. Um, but I also wouldn't be so sure that the person that was guilty of the sexual assault was him. Um, I got you. So, yeah. And just because my sister had told, I don't think I mentioned this yet, but my sister had told my mom that Joey's mom was home from work that week. Uh, that she, I think she told my mom she was on vacation, although they 100% deny that, uh, in that old topics forum, I've read through many, many <laughs> pages of that. We have them printed out cause that doesn't exist anymore. I'm sure yeah. people would literally rip him apart if it still existed. Um, but he was writing in there back and forth with, with all of our family and we were all fighting back and forth back then things were really tense, but, uh, he wrote in there that that wasn't true. She wasn't home, uh, that she was at work, but he mentions that court case that they had going on. And he does say that she was home a few days for that court case. And I haven't been able to look that up. I need to see if I can find that, um, just to confirm what days maybe they would have been home and not been home. Um, but I don't know. My gut tells me she was in the house that day. Um, so with all this, it's been, it's been 20 years, you have little to no answers in 20 years. What, um, what can people do to help? What do y'all need? So the other day, like I was so upset after this whole warrant thing was going on. And I was like, the people that are seeing my posts now, like there's so many more. It's, it's grown so much, especially on Facebook in the last couple of days. I just want to make it known like that's not what I'm trying to do. I don't I don't even care if if I get a heart or whatever or how many followers there are. Um, 
like my only care is Jennifer and Adriana and, and my mom will tell you, and I'm a hundred percent with this. Like we don't even care if we even find out who did it. If someone would just tell us where Jennifer and Adriana are, that is my priority. So I say that because social media has like literally blown this up after they got that warrant served the other day. And I was telling my husband and I was like really upset and I was like, what am I doing this for? Like, what is the point in me asking people to share? Like, is that helping? And, and it is, it, it did. It continues to, I have talked to so many people close to that family, people that I've never talked to. I made a post the other day that, that certain people would not talk to me. And I called out a few of them just kind of, discreetly called them out. Even one of those people reached out to me. So being able to have those conversations, it's just from people sharing things on social media. It is impactful mm -hmm. and it works. And it and I need people to continue doing that. It's died down in the last couple of days because everyone's waiting to know what after after I you know confirmed it wasn't related to our case, everyone's like, oh man, disappointed. I'm not disappointed. I am waiting for his court hearing on April 5th, because I am waiting for whatever charges that they're about to bring on him. And then I can't wait until they find a way to connect it to my sister and my niece's case, because they got some deep, deep, dark secrets. And I know that our current law enforcement team can do it. So I need people to keep sharing it, share everything. I know that it can get annoying. People don't like to get the Amber alerts because it's annoying. So what? Like, share the post. And then if someone happens to see it that has that one teensy tiny little detail that I need, because I'm I can't connect the dots. I can't say was she home? Did they go on the picnic? Did you see their car out that night anywhere driving on the road? This is a town where we know everyone share the posts. I'm not trying to get anything from it, but it is working, I swear to you. And one day I will tell you every bit of information that people are telling me. I will tell it whenever I find Jennifer and Adriana, but until then I can't. But like the people that I'm talking to, like I probably shouldn't even be talking to. <laughs> so, well, you know what, that, here, here's the thing. So yeah, we, I know that you, you've obviously talked yourself into the whole social media thing, so that's good. But like, as one of my the people who have you seen in the chat, um, Judy is one of my like longtime followers. She lives in Michigan. She's talking about Ethan Crumbly's parents. He was a school shooter in Michigan. Um, they were caught by an observant citizen. Gabby Petito's body was found by social media. The you know Nash, look, you live in Tennessee too, so we can let's just call it what it is. Sometimes the police. Maybe they're overwhelmed and they don't always give things the attention that they deserve. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll word it carefully that way. And when social media got a hold of Riley Strain, they had to do something. Then, Seb then Sebastian Rogers, you know, and Seth was in here. I don't know. He might still be in here, but he was in here earlier, you know, it helped get his kids case out there more. So you have a lot of this. It can make a big difference. And I mean, some people don't just disappear. Mm -mm. They are somewhere and somebody somewhere knows something and y'all deserve answers. And I get what you're saying because a lot of times for people, and I think a really good recent example, and I've talked about this one a few times recently, um, is Natalie Holloway. Mm -hmm. uh, her mom just wanted answers. He, she didn't care what he got. She just wanted to know what happened to her daughter. Same. And so and that's, I know that's obviously what y'all want. You don't want anything other than, than answers. And I think right. that you're, it's been 20 years. You're, you're owed answers. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. Yeah. I agree. And, and, and speaking to Judy in Michigan, so, so, so people are like, Oh, I'm not from there. Uh, I still need those people to share it too. And the reason is, and you can attest to this, Justin, I know nothing about TikTok. Um, I know a little bit about Facebook algorithm, but the people who don't understand how it works, like you share it, Judy in Michigan, and it increases visibility for the town that I'm in and all of these people to see it. So even if you're in a different state or not in our footprint, like continue to share it for me because it does increase visibility here. So that's your way of helping, um, you know, and and yeah, I mean, law enforcement does get overwhelmed and those TikTokers found Riley Strain's bank card on the side and and, you know. <laughs> Do I think some TikTokers are going to walk up? First of all, don't walk on the Benton's property. They found bombs there the other day. Like, don't do it. 
Did not do um, that. You know, if you want to go walk out in the parks and whatnot, and you want to help me find the picnic area, do it. Um, I will be uh, putting together searches after after I figure out what happens in the next couple of days. Um, you keep me posted on that. I'll help you organize that. I'll come up. I mean, you're not far. You're you're in Springfield still. I'm guessing. Uh, or? No, no, I live in Mount Juliet oh. now. Oh, but, oh, then you're close to me. Okay, you're real close then. Um, yeah. So, yeah, but Springfield's not that far for me. I think it's like 40 minutes or so. I'll, I'll go. We'll, we'll stream the whole thing. Let's do it. Let's do it. We're. Um, I don't know if you've seen too or what you found, but I'm in the middle of also helping produce a podcast too uh, for Jennifer and Adriana, investigative style. So she'll be interviewing like all of the people that she can get in touch with. So we'll be doing that too. It's I saw that. that. Missing in Hushtown is what that's called. Um, and she's great. And she was there with me the day of the warrant and she'll be there with me if you come out with me too. Um, so whenever I, I do that, people bring up wells a lot, you know, like old country wells, like well water, like old ones that people don't use anymore. They bring those up a lot. They bring up pig farms a lot as far as our case is concerned. So concrete is just, concrete is probably the number one. Um, and then wells are probably number two. And so um, that's on my on my list of like immediate things to do is get with the, the local water company and figure out how I can get like a map of where those wells are. That'll be the first thing that I look into. The issue with rural areas is there's a lot of places that you can hide people or things yeah. or whatever you don't want found. And that becomes, you know, the challenge. But I know I agree with you. I think that, you know, because even if Judy in Michigan, for example, uh, shares it there it, and we get a lot of you know interest on it and people know the story and know where to call, they people will start happily bombarding the police department, you know, to the point that it's annoying for them and they might have to start doing something, which, you know, that's fine. You know, squeaky wheel gets the grease again, right. 20 years with no, 20 years with no answers. Um, and a new detective, still no answers. It, it seems like, it sounds like you have the TBI, you got some new people with the TBI. So that's good. But again, somebody knows something and they've, they've got, they're somewhere and I'm going to guess they're probably on that property. That's a lot of people's guess. It's either, it's either that, so it all has to do with that Thursday phone call home. It's either whatever happened had already happened and they were calling him home to help clean up the mess. Mm -hmm. uh, or whenever he got home, they went on the picnic and wherever that picnic location is, you know, because I don't know, we've put a lot of thought into it and, and law enforcement and I have talked about it and we're like, you know, they've led us on the property before, albeit permissible searches. We've been on the property. And, and would that be so if they were on the property? And if they're I, very confident, if they're very confident, they know a permissible search just means you're going to look and not really do any digging or anything else. That's what my mom has always said. And so, yeah, I can see that. Um, I don't know. My honest opinion is, is like, let's just look everywhere. Um, that's something as a family member of a missing person, like I literally just want to just start going door to door, <laughs> which I mean, people are not going to let you on their property sometime, but a lot of people will. And so like, I, I really just want to do that. I mean, I have the strong urge to just literally start going to every house in Springfield and just see if they're there. Um, you know, of course, if they're buried 10 feet under the ground, then that's gonna, you know, but make it the, difficult. Yeah. The cemetery next door to their house, it's literally right next door. Um, that comes in to question a lot too. a lot of people uh, bring that up just because like, it's very difficult to have a grave exhumed. Um, you know, in a cadaver dog, of course, they're going to smell human remains. Um, yeah, know, freshly dug grave right before the vault goes in. Yeah. You know, it's it's going to look yeah. like disturbed. That's that's also something that's easy. Yeah, I think but... it might be, you know what, Just I'm just going to say this. It might be interesting to talk to the funeral home if nobody has and see if they have records from that weekend or that week in 2004 and see if anybody 
was had a funeral. Yeah, I wonder if they will. Um, you tell them what it's for, they might, you might, you know, like, you know, it, it's just an interesting thought. It's just a thought. Because yeah. If it's right there, you know, and that's again another thing they could be very confident about if that's what they did. That would be, I mean, honestly, yeah, somebody was buried in March 20, you know, 2004 there. Or somebody, I haven't madly say someone was buried there. So it's, it would be very convenient for them. Right. I don't know. I'll add that one to my list because I've never thought about doing that before. I know that my mom has walked that graveyard plenty of times. Um, and the Bentons had a family member that died right around that time, too. Uh, a young girl got into a car accident. But I don't know exactly when she died. But um, I don't know. That's come up before. And we've had people come forward and say, you know, that he didn't put, like, their entire bodies in there. But, like, put, it's very graphic. But, like, yeah, parts to them that you can't, that makes it where you can't identify them, yeah. Um, you know? So I don't know, there's all kinds of people that come forward with information. And so the problem is Justin, especially in a 20 year old case is there's a lot of rumors and especially in a small town with a lot of young people at the time that are now grown up. Uh, but at the time they were partying and they were bragging and that they knew this or knew that. And so it's the telephone game is what it is. And so you're trying yeah. to find who made the first call and, and that's very difficult to do. And what I don't want to do, what law enforcement doesn't want to do is I don't want to chase down all of these. I will, but I don't want to chase down all of these theories. I want to start with like the most prominent ones um, so I feel like if we can get a warrant to get on that property specifically for Jennifer and Adriana, I feel like you're right. They're probably on the property. Um, or so Jason. I don't, yeah, I don't know, but I feel like with the dad being, um, with his dad being in jail and that coming from whatever inside their home, I feel like maybe, you know, I don't know if it wasn't Joey, potentially he'll, soften up and talk to me eventually if it wasn't him well maybe it's been 20 years though yeah yeah <laughs> you can only hold on to it for so long yeah fair enough what fair i'm enough. hoping well, for anyway <laughs> are y'all as far as like any independent investigations or pis have y'all looked into that at all or i'm sure you have yeah we had an original private investigator that my mom hired but he was on it for a short period of time it was before the case changed to homicide in 2013 um, and then we've had the same private investigator pretty much since then. And, um, he's been with us. He's like family to us. Uh, he's worked our case pro bono. He's never asked for That's a thing. Nice. Uh, I work very closely with him too. Um, he has like just an insane amount of information and interviews and his own theories and whatnot, but still similar to law enforcement. Like we just need, like, we need that piece of the puzzle. Yeah, hopefully someone, somebody where we'll give it to you. But in the meantime, we can definitely keep sharing your story and people need to follow you on all platforms. So it's um, Jennifer and Adriana Wicks on TikTok. I think it's the same thing on Insta, right? It is, yeah. Yeah, same thing on Insta. And then for your Facebook, I saw it earlier, but I don't know. What is it off the top? I don't know it off the top of my head. What is your Facebook? On Facebook, it's Justice for Jennifer and Adriana Wicks. It's kind of long. Um but that's where I usually do most of my posting, but I'm trying to like just branch out because people use different things. But a lot of my posting is on there. A lot of our photos are on there. Jennifer and Adriana, uh, you know, which one, the photos we do have, which is not a lot, but yeah, if they could follow me, follow my story, because I told people the other day, I went live on Facebook and I was like, I know everyone's disappointed about that warrant not being directly related, but this is not over. Um, you know, just give law enforcement time to, to do what they're doing right now. Let them execute that warrant and, and let's see if, if it relates to Jennifer and Adriana in any sort of way, because it's not over. And honestly, it happening on the 20 year anniversary to the day it yeah. happened on the 20, it was just, I don't know, just, 
some people believe in signs, some people believe in like superstitious stuff like that, but there's been too many of those things lately. So um, I don't believe it's all for nothing. And I, I'm hoping that that 20 years is our last year. No, perhaps, perhaps it really, I mean, I don't, you obviously know more than me. So, in, and I don't need you to correct me if I'm wrong or whatever, because I don't want you to divulge anything that's going to affect the case, obviously. But um, it almost makes you wonder if they're saying it's not related to this, it's not related to that, but maybe it really is. And they're just not wanting to spook anyone. Well, yeah, exactly. And potentially that is a possibility because they do not have to tell me. Um, and then potentially while they were there, they did find something. I mean, of course, if it were Jennifer and Adriana, we would already know. Uh, but if they found anything that does give them the potential to get that warrant, they don't have to let me know immediately. They have to get yeah. their ducks in a row and, and put that plan together, go to the DA and do all of that. Everything takes time, unfortunately, where we just want to march right up there and bust down their door and bust up their concrete. <laughs> but yeah, I get that. You know, I mean, I'll show up with a sledgehammer. You name the time place, I'll show up. Um, <laughs> Uh, so Deborah's saying to ask you to share the Chains of Hope event. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Deborah. Um, or Debbie, maybe, if it's who I think it is. Um, yeah, so we have an event coming up in April. Uh, so we typically try to uh, do something for Jennifer and Adriana on the anniversary of their disappearance every year. Uh, my mom and her late husband used to do something called the Chain of Hope ride. It's a motorcycle ride, sort of like a benefit ride that they do for like the toy runs and things like that. But we do it for Jennifer and Adriana. We used to do like big balloon releases, uh, prayer vigils and things like that. And then um, the Chain of Hope ride is what it's called. It really hit it off whenever my stepdad was still here and my mom um, hasn't done it the past couple years, but she wanted to do one for their 20 year. And so that's going to be in April. Um, I think it's the third Saturday of April. Just you're on my phone right now. So I can't look at my calendar. Yeah. 27th, maybe 17th. Um, but the events on Facebook. So if you go on my Facebook, you can see it on there and I'll continue sharing it until we get there. But they're saying um, the 27th. It is. Okay. Um, cool. Good. My memory works. Um, but yeah, if you're able to come to that, you don't have to ride a motorcycle to come to that. That's just something for the motorcycle riders to do and that we've done for years and years. And it was huge at one time, like over 300 bikes. And, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool to see and hear. What time, and, what time do y'all do that? And here's why I'm asking. So on the 27th, I'm supposed to, so, you know, well, you, you live near the area. So it's Gallatin square fest and I'm supposed to be, um, like an, at, for the library in Gallatin, um, an, the, like the author that they have. Cause I wrote, a, I wrote a couple books. Um, oh, be cool. out there. So I'm supposed to be there for yeah, the children's books. Mm -hmm. Huh? I said children's books. Children's That's books. Yes. Earlier. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I did that. I have. And um, so they want me to be out there for that. And I have to go do that, uh, obviously, but I wouldn't mind coming out. Well, so it, it would have to be after square fest though. If, if, if it doesn't work out, then that's going to suck. But um, yeah. what time are y'all doing it at? I want to say without having it right in front of me, I want to say, Kickstands up is what they call it. Is that like 11, 10 or 11 in the morning? Oh, yeah. And they start at Kmart in Goodlitzville because they have a really big parking lot. And then everyone has to like sign their waiver forms and things like that. Um, and then we take a good old nice ride um, through the country roads on down Owens Chapel. Um, and that's always a good thing and just kind of helps that family remember that we're not going anywhere. Um but yeah, it, it lasts for a couple hours, then they'll end somewhere and it'll, it'll be, you know, a good place for everyone to talk about Jennifer and Adriana and just gather and have fun, be together, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, we got that going on. I want to say 10 or 11. Yeah, um, I'd love to be at the square fest. And I don't have a bike, but I do have a DeLorean and I would have totally brought that. Okay. Yeah. But, we but, do that. but, but I probably do it next year though, because I got to do the square fest thing. Otherwise yeah. I would totally be there. Well, hopefully we're not doing the ride next year, Justin, but um, well, fair, fair. <laughs> hopefully so. If we are, I'll see you there. And um, yeah, so whoever wants to come out to that, come out to that. Uh, we'll have shirts. We always like print shirts or like bracelets or 
little flags or something to like do donations and I'm collecting donations. I don't know if you saw that. I'm having a mural. Painted. I didn't see that. Okay. Um, so, you know, murals are big right now. They're all over Nashville. It's really cool. Actually. I think it makes our town look really cool in our cities. Um, they're even in the smaller towns. There's one in white they house, are. actually some in Springfield. So I'm trying some in to downtown talk. Gallatin. There's some in downtown yeah. Gallatin. Yeah. So we've got some really good artists in our area. And so I've already uh, retained the artist and I'm just trying to find the location. I've been offered a location very close to or in the Owens Chapel community <laughs> that everyone. Oh, I love it. Try. So I might do that. And that is right now my number one spot, but we'll just have to see. Um, but yeah. So those are the two things we got going on for their 20 year that, that we had planned. Of course, the best gift of all was the search warrant. <laughs> Absolutely. So if people want to donate to the mural, where can they do that? Um, we have a GoFundMe that I've had open for years and years. Um, right now, specifically collecting for that later will be, and if we don't find Jennifer and Adriana, we'll be collecting for legal representation for, for funds to secure that um but it's um gofundme.com slash jennifer and adriana wicks okay and wicks is w-i-x y'all yeah wix yeah is w -I -X. W -I -X. and adriana has so. two n's so there um, you go so yeah if anyone wants to do that that would be helpful it's supposed to start um being painted in june so okay. coming up soon and uh i haven't shown anyone i might show at the ride if i get the artwork in time uh what i have kind of picked out for that but it's not going to be like a missing persons poster you know or a giant portrait of them or something i just want to do something like representative of them that just kind of like gives us a spot to go and you know ride past and things like that whenever we do the anniversary rides you know i really do wish i could go out for that and i if it wasn't if I didn't have to have made that commitment to the library, I would totally do it. But any other events that y'all do, I'm I'm down for it. Are you planning on going? I'm guessing probably not. But are you planning on going to his hearing on the 5th? I want to. Um, I'm not going to be there, but I, we will be there. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going right. to say who. I'm not going to be there, but we will be there. I'm going to be out of town. Yeah. Somebody will be there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, again, I appreciate you sharing the story and, I, and I, I'm glad that you did because I think that there was, when that story broke, a lot of people, especially in Tennessee, were like, what the hell's going on? And, you know, because it's, when you have a, a break or what appears to be a break in a major case, especially a, a very old case, um, people get interested. So right now you have a lot of people that that do have interest. So take, I would say take advantage of that because, yeah, you sure. know, this medium, TikTok specifically didn't exist, you know up till a few years ago. Right. And so it's, it's a great platform, this kind of stuff. And, and again, your story, you tell it well, it's, it's, you know, it's got, all, I hate to say it this way, but it's, it's got, I said captivating earlier and that's what it is. It, it's, it grabs people's attention. It's interesting and people are going to want to help find them. Yeah. I hope so. so. And thank you for, for doing this. I know you've got a big voice out there on TikTok. So thanks for, for telling Jennifer and Adriana's story. Absolutely. Well, no, you're the one that did it. You just, I just like, gave you my platform to amplify it. So that's Thank what we're you. supposed to do with this. But all right, well, we're going to wrap it up. And um, if there's anything else, you have my number, give me a call. And, uh, you know, I appreciate everything. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, everyone that's watching or comes back to watch. But yeah, thanks, Justin. All right. Have a good night. You too.